Michelle, Hi, how you doing? How are you? I'm great. <laughs> L listen, Michelle, I got you in this big theater. Look at your face. It's, it, it, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it looks huge here. Yeah, that's that's a that's a very large <laughs> picture of my face. <laughs> well, we're we're so excited to have you. You here. must really like me. <laughs> Well, we're so excited to have you here uh, as part of ACG Edmonton's Corporate Growth Summit. Um, and for everyone sort of watching this at home, I need your help during this session. Uh, I need you to be as interactive and as engaging as possible during the session. Uh, so the, what that means is um, in the chat function, ask your questions. We want to get to as many questions as we can. Uh, you know, I have a, a whole bunch of questions that I want to ask Michelle, but uh, I need your help to make this as engaging as possible. And, and, and Michelle, you know, you're such a, uh, you're the pride and joy of, of Alberta. You know, you're born in Calgary, raised in Regina. You're, yeah. you, you have oil and gas in your blood. Your, your father <laughs> was an engineer, became the CEO of Nexon. Like, it's in your blood. Um, what does it mean to be a product of the West? Yeah, I mean, I don't think... Uh... That's strange. I don't think anyone ever mentions um, my dad, but I, I am very much a product of, of Western Canada. And I think being from the West actually just means you're very entrepreneurial in thinking and in nature. I still think there is like a wild West component that is that is incredibly um, you know, alive and well. I mean, one of the one of the stats I always love is like all of the three women um, on Dragon's Den are all from Calgary. I mean, Manjeet's from Calgary, Arlene's a product of Calgary, I was a product of Calgary. And I think it was just about, um, it was about thinking differently. We, we talk about the tech industry as being, you know, wildly innovative and lots of disruption, but you know, the oil and gas industry was was just as creative. There was so much technology that went into figuring out how to find this product. I remember like even as a kid understanding SAGD drilling versus other types of drilling and how crazy it was that you could like go into the middle of the ocean and like go down multiple kilometers basically into the earth to find this product that all allowed us to, you know, transport goods and services and, and turn on our, our lights and produce the energy that we needed to grow. And so I think that's... Um, that's always been a part of me. It's just very entrepreneurial, very scrappy. I think I'm very down to earth. I still don't take myself too seriously and I still love to ride a horse. Well, you, I, well, there you go. You still love to ride a horse. Um, you know, I, I, think, I think you embody what Alberta is all about, which is really being a hustler. You know, throughout your career, you have basically jumped into all these different endeavors with little to no experience, I, whether it's into coffee or caviar <laughs> or snap saves or uh, at Dragon's Den into the VC world. I, yeah. I'm just curious, um, how have all these ventures sort of piggybacked off each other and what, what have you learned from going from one to one to, to another? So my experience is that when you want to disrupt something, it's actually way more beneficial to be the customer of something than to have been in an industry. Because when you're in an industry, you know all the limitations of that industry. And so everyone just says, that's not the way we do it. We've always done things a certain way. We can't do things anything differently. Oh, there's a regulation, there's a rule, there's a process. We tried that five years ago. I mean, that's what you hear when you're in an industry. And so for me, I just always looked at how the world was changing and then how, how people would need to adapt. And so, you know, I think the, the clear bank example makes a lot of sense here. Um, what I saw from my perspective is I had been a serial entrepreneur my whole life and I had run an e-commerce company for five years where no one would give me capital, right? We had great unit economics, we had a great business and like we just had either terrible equity offers or no equity offers, like it never made sense. We just kind of kept kept bootstrapping. And I remember thinking I could go so much faster, you know, with more capital. And our original idea from ClearBank actually came from Dragon's Den. I'm on the show. I'm 28 years old when I joined the show. Like I'm truly the runt of the litter, right? I'm the youngest person on the show. I'm definitely the poorest person on that panel at the time. And all I can think is, you know, we're watching 250 pitches in 17 days. And all of the early stage e-commerce pitches are sounding the same shot. It's I'm here, I'm willing to give up 5% of my business for $100,000. Um, 
And what was unique is when you asked those entrepreneurs what they needed the capital for, it was always for the same two things. It was, I need capital to buy Facebook and Google ads. So I need money for customer acquisition, or I need capital to buy inventory. And so I started thinking about this and I was like, wait a second, founders are using the most expensive capital, which is equity always. You give a you know, piece of your company that you don't get back and you give up control to do something that's actually repeatable and scalable. And I was like, huh, that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. So I actually remember on Dragon's Den, you can still find the episode. I was like, okay, I'm going to throw out a different deal type. Instead of doing that, why don't I just give you the hundred thousand dollars you're looking for? And instead of taking 5% of your business, I just want 5% of your revenue until you pay me back my capital plus a 6% flat fee. I'm not, I, I don't want any warrants. I don't want any control. I don't have a personal guarantee in your business. I just, I want to do this rev shift. And the founder that day was like, yeah, hundred percent. I want your deal. I was like, as a founder, I would have taken this deal all day long, but you know, we started pitching this to Wall Street because we needed all this money to get up. And Sean, there was 249 people that said no to us. They said, you don't understand credit. This won't work. You guys are gonna, you guys are gonna lose all your money. And I mean, four years later, you know, in the last two years, we put out $1.6 billion to founders. I mean, that's larger than most of the biggest VC funds put out in eight years. Uh, we've, we've backed more than 4,000 different founders, which is insane. We're the largest e-commerce investor on the planet now. And, you know, back to your question, I didn't have experience in finance because all of the finance people, now everyone's like, oh my God, you guys built a new asset class. This is amazing. I'm like, we didn't come at it understanding finance. We were not looking for a piece of financial engineering. What I deeply understood was e-commerce founders. And I deeply understood um, that, that this was just too difficult. And that if we could do this in a data-driven way where we just got you to connect the apps that run your business, we give you a term sheet in 20 minutes, which was way faster than what it would take in a conventional process. So that was really kind of the excitement of, of figuring this out. But I don't think you need background in an industry. I mean, we have to learn. I learned we we read case law in regulation to make sure that we were compliant. So it's not like you don't have to do your homework. It just doesn't mean you come in with all the biases of the rest of your industry. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny because uh, you, you mentioned you pitched ClearBank to all when you were raising uh, for ClearBank, and everybody said no to you. What? Why was it so disruptive? Like, why did they all say no? Because to me, what ClearBank is. It's actually anti Dragons Den, if I'm uh, able to say that and be provocative. Like, you're not taking equity, and I think that it 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 flies in the face of many folks that are in the VC, you know, PE world. What was? Why did they all say no? What 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 is it that they didn't get about what you were trying to do? Is it because of the digital piece? Uh, help me explain, because I know lots of people within this audience are in this world, and they probably don't understand the the value prop for ClearBank. Um, either. So can you explain to me how you were able to convince them? Yeah. I mean, first of all, you, the, the great part about VC fundraising is you only ever need to, um, you only ever need to convince one person. <laughs> I think that's, that's the, the important part of this. And so here's, you know, look, our value prop to founders was that use, depending on where you're spending the money, use different forms of capital. So if you are trying to put a man on the moon and if you're trying to build a rocket and if you need 50 engineers or 100 engineers, that is true equity level risk. That's zero to one risk. There is a real shot that you could hire all those engineers and work for three years and nothing would happen. And that's really the type of risk you should be using capital where you give up equity and control of your company. But if you are doing things that are repeatable in your business, if you are going out and buying a dollar of Facebook ads and making three bucks out of that, you know what the return is going to be. Why are you using the most expensive capital? And so that was our value prop for founders. In addition to that, we could give you a term sheet in 20 minutes. And so the typical fundraising process is three to six months. You do a hundred meetings, you look for a great equity investor, and it's just so time consuming. You take your eye off the ball. I mean, I've, I've done this. I've raised a lot of venture capital. It's very, very difficult. There's a ton of bias in the system as well for the industry you're building and, and who you are and what your background. And so our value prop was you can use cheaper capital, you can get it faster, and we'll scale with you up to 10 million bucks. And people didn't believe we can do this. People didn't believe that, that data would be indicative enough. They thought we would lose all of our money. 
They thought there was something incredibly unique about meeting founders that you needed to understand to see if they would be successful. I totally believe that founders build a business. I just believe that there's a lot of data exhaust that comes that we could use. And you know, we, weren't, we were playing to get our capital back plus 6%. And so we didn't need to vet a founder for if this business model could grow at 10X every year for the next 10 years. I don't really think that's a, it's a ridiculous piece of criteria. I understand why it works because of the venture capital model, but that actually has forced so many really good businesses to really go off the rails, just trying to grow just incredibly quickly. Um, and so this was very disruptive, right? No one thought that we could do this. No one thought that we would get big doing this. They're like, oh, this will be cute. You guys will deploy, you know, 20 or $50 million. Um, but we've showed all these entrepreneurs and, and our TAM is enormous. I mean, we have, there's 25 million e-commerce businesses around the globe, 5,000 of them got VC funding last year. And so this is the, the big part of the middle that I think we can totally change um, by doing this a bit differently. The other piece of insight that I took is that VCs do really two primary pieces of diligence. They do diligence on the founder. And then they do, they do diligence where they look at the business and they're looking at the same things every time. They're looking at, your LTV to CAC ratios, how much you're spending to get a customer, how much you're acquiring. And we could actually digitize a lot of that. And that was the basis of, you know, what we built kind of our algorithms on. And then honestly, Sean, I couldn't even tell you what's in our data science models. Now we're ingesting like hundreds of thousands of pieces of data. They're all being weighted. They're all competing models. And uh, I wish I could tell you what's all in them, but, <laughs> but it's, it's really, they're learning from themselves now, not me. No, that's great. Um, and by the way, I want to remind everybody to, uh, if you have some questions, please uh, put it in the chat. We'd love to see uh, some of those questions coming in. We do have one question coming in that says, it may seem easy for a mature business to think or believe that they can innovate or disrupt. Michelle, what advice would you offer that business leader who's looking to you know, innovate or disrupt their mature business? Yeah, well, the first thing is you're thinking about all of the right stuff because every single business is being just like affected by innovation way faster than ever before. One of my favorite kind of macroeconomic charts shows that, you know, the average length of company on the S and P 500 50 years ago used to be 50 years. And so we'd have 50 years until companies were, were basically disrupted or replaced by, by the next generation of them. And there's been companies like Campbell's soup that, you know, we are still eating soup and they've been on the S and P for a hundred years, but the average length of the company was 50 years. Today, when we look at the average length of a company on the S&P, it's 20 years, which means that in one career, if our careers are 40 years long, like we will be fully disrupted at least once. Um, and these disruptions can occur very fast. So what do you wanna do if you, you wanna bring this to your own organization? I think the first thing is you wanna think about being really scrappy. Like innovation isn't about a giant roadmap or a big idea. It's about trying and testing things rolling up your sleeves, being like, I'm going to call the customer myself. I'm going to find the resources when they don't seem to exist. And I'm going to put some points on the board doing this. That's, I think, the, the first thing is that just trying to get an early quick win to get people on board and to build momentum is super important. I think the second thing, you know, in an organization is organizations love to plan. <laughs> and I get it. And there's a stable business to protect. But being innovative, again, is about moving from planning to execution. And so putting together like a little straw man plan about, you know, here's why I think we're excited and here's what we should try. It should truly like fit on a post-it basically. And then really going out to execute and start iterating. And then the secret is those iterations, all of those little tests that you're running is ultimately what's becoming a big source of innovation. And most people don't think this. They think that, um, you know, innovation comes from one massive idea brainstorm. Like I always love the Uber story because so few people know it. I mean, Uber over the last 10 years, they've been called like inventing the sharing economy and disrupting the way we move and all of that stuff. But Uber didn't start with that massive idea. Uber started as an auto dialer. So that means instead of calling a black car company, you would press a button and it would auto dial you to a black car company. And like it would attempt to give some level of location coordinates and it didn't work at all. You know, they ended up getting lucky and launching in the worst city in the world for taxis, which was San Francisco. They then, you know, took the peer-to-peer -peer idea from Lyft. But again, for a company that size and scale, the innovation actually started quite small. And so it's actually those iterations that allow you to be, build a big innovation, which 
in, in most people's minds should make it so much easier to start trying and testing things, um, which is how you, can, how you can really get started in a big organization. Yeah. You know, you know what I find fascinating about ClearBank, and I, I, I've never seen anybody ask you this question, and maybe I'll just sort of, I don't know if I'm unveiling the hood of ClearBank, but <laughs> you've invested in over, you know, 1.6 bill into, you know, over 4,000 startups. To me, what you are doing, obviously, you're, you're, you're providing unbelievable capital for all these different startups, and, um, yeah. but to me, what's really interesting is you actually have all the data around what they're doing in terms of customer acquisition. Yeah. Um, and so once you compile all that data of how people are using their advertising spend, you literally could create like your own clear bank backed products uh, in the e-commerce space, in the direct to consumer space, because you already yeah. know what's working. Um, and I think, I don't know even know if you've thought about that, but to me, <laughs> that's the most exciting piece is that you're collecting all this data from all these different uh, this, these organizations because that's how you uh, are, are compensating them. Um, is that going to be the future play of Clear, Clear Bank? Will you introduce your own uh, Clear Bank products? No, um, <laughs> you know it, it's certainly it's certainly creative. I think you have to be uh, tremendously respectful of your of your customers' data, and we use our data. I mean, imagine, like, think about if a VC did that, if they well, well, if they gathered a bunch of data and then they built, you know, competitive products based on what they- Well, Michelle, uh, <laughs> to be honest with you, that's what well, that's what Amazon does. Amazon has, their, their, they are platform, they aggregate all the data on which yeah. batteries are selling, and they're like, you know what? We're gonna sell our own batteries now. And- Totally. Uh, so, and, you know- And you I totally understand that Amazon has done that. We are not gonna do that. Um, <laughs> just because I think, I'm interested in being the largest investor in the world. I'm interested in every single person around the planet that has a good idea being able to get not only access to capital, but access to network and advice. Because this is how the world works right now. In capital raising, and we all know this, there is, it's a human to human business. So in a human to human business, you use human to human filters. And so you do things like, well, you know, VCs don't take, cold email introductions. They just take warm email introductions because it's the first filter of getting through and, and knowing someone. And that's fine and it's a good sorting mechanism, but it's just built a, a system that is uh, very restrictive. So, I mean, if you go to Harvard or Stanford, 40% of VCs in the United States go to Harvard or Stanford. So you have no problem raising venture capital. If you grew up in any of the other states in America, there was nine states in America last year that had zero companies that got access to venture capital funding. <laughs> like, that's crazy. This is the most entrepreneurial country in the world. You're gonna tell me that there was no entrepreneurs in nine states in America <laughs> that had great ideas. And that's where we think our opportunity is, is just so big to go after that. And I think that we have, we have so much more on the network and advice thing. Um, and then Sean, personally, like I've run an e-commerce store. That's, a, that, that's really tough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so and I know what it's like to source products. I mean, we uh, we sourced an enormous amount of the the PPE that came into Canada during the last crisis. Like, it is a hard logistics business, um, and so I am I am eagerly building the capital business. So, so that so that uh, brings me to my next question because you actually introduced something that's uh, incredibly innovative, which is the first ever automated angel investor. Let me repeat that. The first ever automated angel investor. Um, you know, most people would say that angel investing is more of an art than a science. Uh, yeah. It seems pretty audacious to create an automated angel investor. So can you tell us uh, the, the, the reasoning behind it and why it's so disruptive? So the first thing is this project was really hard. This project probably failed almost 16 times before we got it out the door. What we had seen very early in our data is that our clear, our, you know, our core capital products for giving capital for marketing expenses and inventory expenses, a company needed to be doing a minimum of $10,000 in monthly revenue because then we had just enough data to see if this company was gonna make it. And so as a part of that process, you know, we funded 4,000 companies, but we had turned down 50,000 companies. And that was what really hit me hard. So I knew that I was saying no to a lot of entrepreneurs that were really 
you know, very interested in, in being able to capitalize their companies. And so <laughs> this didn't almost work so many times. We had to start building the tools of what it takes. We had to start thinking about how would we automate Y Combinator? How would you create goal setting? How could you automate email introductions? How could you automate, um, you know, getting connected to the right people? How could you like keep people on track in a very different way? I mean, just the software behind what we had to build there to engage people was totally different. And then because we were taking way more risk, we were basically talking to companies that had just started to make their first a thousand or two thousand dollars of revenue. We had to change the model a little bit. And so we were getting, you know, we were putting some money in up front with way more risk and then taking that capital, you know, over a much longer period of time. Um, and so it's been pretty exciting. I, we're, we're building this in, in real time. So we're actually showing every day, um, you know, how many more companies that we are getting through this. But uh, I think it has the real chance to, um, to be pretty groundbreaking. For well, uh, we do have a, a whole bunch of questions from the audience. I just wanted to piggyback off the Clear Angel piece because I think it's really important uh, yeah. that this is, uh, this is actually opening up the doors for uh, folks from diverse backgrounds, uh, folks yeah. that wouldn't traditionally have access to capital, uh, you know, uh, females, uh, p uh, people of color, uh, people in cities that nobody has ever heard of. Uh, so can you chat a little bit about that? That that was the whole benefit of using a data-driven model is that we got to blow up the old model because we just tested something new. And we showed that like our results, and we didn't expect this. This is the most important thing. We didn't go out saying, you know, we're going to recruit women or recruit people from, from different places. We just said, look, we have a great product. We can fund you if you have great you know, unit economics, you know, connect us to the apps that run your data, we'll give you a term change funding. And when we look back on our data, Sean, I mean, we've backed eight times more women than the venture capital industry average. We have backed founders in all 50 states in America. It's the same internationally in the UK, 70% of our founders live outside of London. And a huge portion of our founders are people of color. And so that is just the benefit of kind of changing the game on some of this is that you get to see that, and, and this is stuff that we always knew. Like I can tell you one of our very first customers was an ex-military veteran that had come back and had built a subscription box business. And we were like, no, we're, we're we gave him his first $10,000. I mean, he owns a business that's like doing 25 million bucks now. It's, it's fantastic. Um, but it is, it is allowing so many more people with ideas to come to us. Yeah, I know. I love that. And, and, and thank you for doing that for not only, you know, Canadians, but for folks around the world, uh, giving people access to that. I, I love it. Can't, can't wait to see more from uh, Clear Angel. I, I just imagine like a big AI sort of just giving me money. That would be great. Um, <laughs> that would be a good visual, just like the, the money gun, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> shoots out. Uh, we, we got a question from Eric Ham Hamden who says, and, you know, and there's actually a lot of people in this audience that are sort of in this space, uh, VC world. They're just really curious about the commercial model for ClearBank. And it would be great for her to talk about, said, uh, Eric said, it's great for her to talk about um, how ClearBank make, makes money, monetization, fees, et cetera. Can you sort of unveil the hood a little bit about, about how that all works? Yeah, I mean, we, um, we're, we're really transparent with our fees. We make a 6% flat fee on the capital that we put out. Um, so if we're giving a founder a hundred grand, we're taking a percentage of their revenue until we get $106,000 back. Um, if our capital is spent on ads and inventory and we have dynamic pricing, if it's spent on, on other categories, but you know, the, the highest we are is 12%. So it's really not um, prohibitive. And uh, you know, that's, that's kind of our business model is that we, that's why we have to put out, you know, a lot of capital and our data science has to be very good because our upside is um, is really limited, but that's that's been the way that we've been able to um, to adapt that. A lot of people think that looks like a loan, but small business loans are very different. They have personal guarantees, they have fixed payment timelines, they have compounding interest. You know, we have a model where if we're successful and the, the debtor is successful, we get paid back a little bit faster. We even have some limitations on how fast we can get paid back, so um, you know we can't hurt the founder. And um, and then we have and it took us a long time to get that because. You know, it's it's taken us a long time to to figure out how to lower our cost of capital. And in the early days, I mean, we had 20, 30 percent default rates. This is really hard to do in in the early days and figure it out. But that is uh, that's our commercial model. Yeah, no, it 
It, but isn't it incredibly difficult to not know when, uh, like, because you don't have an actual uh, end date for a entrepreneur, right? When they have to pay right. something back. So isn't it incredibly stressful for you, uh, for ClearBank to be like, they're, they're, they're floundering. Uh, we, we haven't seen anything in, in years. Yeah, I mean, that's why that's why data science has to be pretty good. We have to see kind of the, the revenue that you are generating today. And um, we have to see the revenue you're generating today and then how we can kind of predict that uh, into the future. And I mean, look, we do like, this means we have to be good, right? We have no backup to take people's personal assets. And that's what's really happened, you know, for the last 100 years in this kind of segment of the market. And it's forced us to be a lot better. It's forced us to, you know, like start to have calls with founders when their business is doing well and suggest things that they should be doing or software they should be using or other ways to, to improve. I mean, we had to do an enormous amount of this during COVID because even though e-commerce was a, a winner in this market, um, there was a lot of volatility getting in. I mean, there was, you know, months where like apparel was not selling and where, um, you know, anything that touched travel or events was not selling. And so we just had to get, we had to get very good around that. Yeah, uh, we got a question from the audience, which is, uh, what do you see as the difference between a US startup founder and a Canadian star startup founder? What is, the, what is the difference in their DNA and also, the difference between a Western Canadian founder and somebody from uh, from the East Coast. Can you give us a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, maybe you're seeing different types of personalities. Um, you know, the best founders are just exceptionally resilient. That's really the, the answer. And resilience is such a unique thing because it comes from a lot of different places. Sometimes resilience and, you know, ambition comes from, like I don't have a lot of other options in life. So I've seen that where like that makes people incredibly motivated because there is no safety net. You see um, a lot of that in American founders. Um, I think some of it comes from just a chip on your shoulder. I certainly had a chip on my shoulder and something to prove. And I try not to bet against those people because they just keep going and they show up into the ring every single day and they've got a black eye and they're ready for round two. Because ultimately being a founder is just, it's so much iteration. It's so many trying things. There was, I mean, this was the third business model we tried at ClearBank. This is yeah. 10 years into me being an entrepreneur. I don't think most people appreciate that. It's like, this is a career where 80% of the things you do do not work. They fail. And so you're sitting there being like, oh my God, I just put this thing on my Facebook and my Instagram. I told my friends about it and like none of it's working and I'm going to have to throw it all out. <laughs> that's, that's what you're signing up for um, being an innovator. But what was sorry? I don't, I want what was the core of this question again? It was really about oh the differences in yeah, in, yeah uh, DNA. Because, well, and, and I oh, just yeah. think that you know in Canada for some reason we lack uh, we lack the swagger. Like I think that's uh -huh. probably what it is. And I don't know between West and East, perhaps it's just we're just too humble um, in the West. But maybe because you see you see thousands of different entrepreneurs, yeah. so you can you can really dial into what the DNA is. Totally, I think that there is. Yeah, there, there is that there's, and it's, I mean, like I got, I got some funny stories. So like, I remember we would go to Silicon Valley in our seed round and we're like, we're going to build a bank for founders. And the number of people in Silicon Valley that told me that idea wasn't big enough was absurd to me. Like I'm talking like 20, 30 people is like not a big enough idea. I'm like, what do you guys want? Like a bank for founders on Mars? Like, I just, like, I, I don't really know how to make this idea bigger. I'm already talking about a massive segment of underserved markets. Like, I feel like we can make some progress here. And so there is a DNA in the US about thinking big. And then there is an ecosystem that's created that where, you know, I remember the first time we were pitching for snap saves. I mean, the WhatsApp transaction had just happened. Like we were truly talking to people that had just seen one of their early deals sold for $19 billion. I mean, it was just, it was just an absurd amount of money. It was like, you know, the GDP of a small country could be $19 billion. And here was a messaging app that charged a dollar with a billion users on it that was somehow worth that much. And so I think that is an important part of, of you know, where we need to go as Canadian founders is thinking about thinking bigger 
because of the nature of the companies we are building today, right? There's a reason we talk about the FANG stocks, right? It's because they're bigger than anything else because once you have this data advantage, you can build something truly global that's incredibly hard to compete with. And there, there's own challenges with that, but, but we need those as Canada if we want to win. Like, you know, BlackBerry should have been one of those letters yeah. in FANG. And not missing out on that opportunity because we're not thinking big enough is, is it just a silly reason to lose out. And so I'd say like, you know, there is a humble, there's a humbleness from the East. There's a humbleness from the West sometimes, but it's just about continuing to elevate your level of ambition. And I've had to, I mean, look, when I grew up in Regina, I thought like my version of success is if I could run a little company with like three or four people in it. And all of this has frankly exceeded my wildest expectations. Well, it, um, it yeah, no, it's, it is pretty incredible. And, and on that note, I think, you know, we, we definitely need, you know, and it's unfortunate that BlackBerry couldn't ha carry the sort of the mantle, but I think in Canada, in Western Canada, even in Edmonton, um, having like the LeBron James, like, you know, having the narrative, having the story, yeah. having the somebody carry the mantle globally, um, that just not only attracts talent and investments, uh, but it actually can build the ecosystem around us. Yeah. Um, I call it this idea of inequality in, in, in the sense that once you have like a, a like a beaming light, everyone sort of yeah. will run to it. And I think um, that's been uh, missing in Alberta. It's been missing in Edmonton. Um, I, I, want, I want to chat with you about capital uh, yeah. in a bit. And we, we have some questions around e-commerce as well. But uh, this yeah. is a question from the ACG community, which is, you know, there's a significant amount of dry powder funds on the sidelines still to be deployed. Um, yeah. How should Canadian SME organizations change their approach to attracting new capital now that we're moving out of this pandemic? Yeah. Um, I mean, now I think is a great, I mean, markets are on fire right now. It is unbelievable what we are seeing. I don't think we've ever done this type of experiment in quantitative easing and printing the volume of money that we have printed. And so, you know, that, that I don't think always leads to the best fundamentals, but there is an enormous amount of capital chasing very few assets. And so if you are a Canadian SME, it is time to put yourself out there as an asset that is gonna grow. And I'm a big believer that, you know, as soon as we see widespread vaccination, we are gonna have the roaring 20s. People are gonna be so excited to hug and see each other and go out and do all of the things. I think we will do way more Zooms together. And I think the, the bar to get on an airplane will certainly be higher than it ever was before. But the time people spend together will just be, so incredibly unique. And so if you are one of those SMEs, like it's now your turn to go out there and to paint your version of the story and to, to get your hands. I think that you should, as a founder, you should be raising money, not when you need the money, but when the money is available. You, you never wanna be kind of in the position where you're begging. And I think it's, you know, it's definitely my job as a founder and as a leader to always make sure we do not run out of money and we have that capital to grow. But I think that you're hundred percent right. There is a lot of capital um, waiting to be deployed right now. Yeah. And, uh, and, and Canada's probably going to take advantage of that. Yeah. To, to, to paraphrase what Randy Thompson said in, in, in uh, a previous session was that if you are an SME and you can't, you know, attract funds in this climate, then you're doing something fundamentally wrong uh, because there is a significant amount of dry powder uh, funds out there. Um, I, I want to also chat about the banks. Uh, I, I know there's some folks from banks, traditional banks. Why don't they get digital um, in your mind? Uh, I know that's a bold question. It's a provocative question. And maybe the banks will disagree. But in your mind, why don't they get digital? And to that note, you know, uh, there's some traditional PE firms. They don't get digital either. W what are they missing? Um... It's really hard. That's actually the, the real answer. It's really right. hard and it's a very regulated industry. And so when you are a FinTech trying to make something digital, what I describe this is like, you're here and you're trying to create this beautiful customer experience sitting on top. But like you imagine below the surface, there's like a hundred wires that are like, like putting this all together. And that's just hard to do. I mean, it was very hard to figure out. And so what what happened is that when fintech first started being disrupted, this is probably, you know, the, this, this really started in earnest maybe 10 years ago. We only got kind of a little bit of traction five years ago in kind of 2015. And 
what the fintechs did is they said, look, we're, an average bank has 200 different products. And we're just going to take one of those products and try and do it better. So one of the first ones that, that came out was this idea of wealth management that had been really reserved for people that were just high income earners. And they would you know, get charged 2%. And then you know, Wealth Simple and Betterment and Wealthfront all said, look, we could automate this. We could build one of these robo advisors and do this better. And so for years, all those companies did, and they all became billion dollar companies, just took one banking product and they made it better because it's that hard. And so imagine being a bank, you're regulated, you've got all these rules, you're trying to innovate, you have 200 products to innovate, like where do you start? And so that's one of the reasons it's, it's so hard. And so now what the fintechs are doing, and I call this the, the, the motion between bundling and unbundling. So the first was an unbundling yeah. of all the bank services. Instead of offering people 200 things, we offer people one thing. And then we are now seeing all the fintechs starting to move back to bundling. They're saying, I have one thing that's really great. Can I build a second thing and a third thing that's really great? And so that's why it was so hard for the banks to respond because it wasn't like a few players were coming and saying, I want to build a, a, a bank. It was that every single one of their 200 products was being picked off. And it will now be a race between if the fintechs can acquire customers fast enough um, or if the banks can innovate fast enough on their existing customer base. And there would be that pull between the speed of innovation and digitization and then the um, amount of customers that uh, the incumbents currently have. Yeah, no, I love that. Um, I'm going to come over here and ask you a question, but we, we had a couple, couple questions for, about e-commerce as well. Judy's asking yeah. about, specifically about e-commerce, you know, uh, many of the products are coming from overseas. There's a logistical problem in, in getting sort of your inventory fulfilled. Um, you know, how do you see this sort of shifting um, in the future and how can uh, a lot of these founders deal with some of these logistical sort of issues? So this is a very big, very big question. Um, oh, and the, on, the last, on the last comment on this, the banks and digitization. At the end of the day, the net winner here is the consumer. They are getting better products on the, the FinTech and on the banking side than they ever have before. And a lot of the banks have made a lot of really pretty big strides. And so I think there's actually a, there's a very bright future there. Overseas and logistics, this is a huge problem that is getting even worse. I remember last year in February, we were tracking you know, would products be, you know, leaving Asia coming? And, you know, now I, I, you can read about it in the New York Times. There's this, there's a huge problem with shipping containers um, being delayed on lots of these things. So here's what's, let's just zoom out all over again. Here's what's happening. Last year, you know, before COVID, depending on whose numbers you're looking at, e-commerce was between 13 and 17% of retail sales. And now we are between 22 and 30% of retail sales, depending on if you're looking at international or Canadian or American numbers. That was a 10 year explosion, no matter how we were. We thought we would be all the way in 2030 before we were looking at you know, 20 to 30% of sales being e-commerce driven. And so what that did is it put an enormous amount of different logistical pressures on our shipping and logistics systems, and especially the ones that were coming um, out of Asia. I think that a lot of people have talked about us getting much better at manufacturing products in North America. I actually don't think we're making a huge amount of um, strides there. I think we will still need to figure out these, these massive global logistics chains. And I mean, I, even with vaccines, I mean, we're not getting them produced in Canada, which is I think we have to look at from a from you know a, our own self-reliance standard on, on both of those, those issues. But my guess on the logistics side is, is this will work itself out. One of the most interesting stats I've heard on logistics is that these, I think most logistics companies are like five to 10% digitized. Like there are still thousands of physical pieces of paper and waybills and stuff that is going from freight forwarders and all of that will be digitized now in the next decade. And so we will be able to, to track and manage inventory in a completely different way. And so there's lots of startups that are working very, very hard on this. I think that um, it kind of sucks when you are, you are dependent on something else. And I know we're also in the, in the thicket of everything being delayed from, from Chinese New Year, but um, I think this problem will work itself out. No, that, that, that's great. You know, we got, a, um, we got a great question on the banking front and uh, sort of the last question on the banking is, uh, can, can Michelle comment on how banking is changing or could change so that it'll be easier for Canadian entrepreneurs to move money seamlessly across the US and Canadian border? I don't know if you can address that. Oh, that's a very specific question that um, 
Well, how about just easier for Canadian entrepreneurs? Like, I yeah. think I, 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 I think, you know, many banks treat uh, businesses like they are a brick and mortar business, right? They, they, they don't treat them as pure play digital businesses. Uh, can you give a, a little bit of advice to banks to say, how do we sort of uh, uh, allow these entrepreneurs to, to grow in this, in this country without sort of burning them with all the old school ways of, of uh, how we normally treat businesses? Yeah, we need great innovators. That that is who's going to solve this problem. It is. It's a it's a largely a terrible experience being Canadian with all of these U.S. accounts that don't move, and then they don't have the same features as U.S. banking accounts. Like there is a lot that we can do here. I mean, you think about what has even happened on the credit card side for founders in in the U.S. I, I think one of like my proudest moments was, um, you know, you rarely build something that's meaningful enough that that a big company responds to it and you know, it was really ClearBank and Brex that put out the first two products at scale for founders that didn't have personal guarantees attached. And I, I care deeply about personal guarantees. I remember when we first signed up for payment processing through PayPal, um, I didn't know I signed a personal guarantee. It was somewhere in the size seven font of the payment processing agreement. We agreed to use it. And I remember we had one deal go wrong. And like, I got on a phone call with like six PayPal lawyers and myself, I was 24 years old. And they're like, we want to let you know you're personally liable for the million dollars you have processed through your PayPal payment processor. And I was like, what do you mean? And they're like, yeah, you could owe us all of that money. And I was like, in my head, I was like, well, I have $10,000 in my bank account. So that's a really far away from a million dollars. Yeah. And I think that that was a, that was just a really, I mean, I didn't sleep for six weeks. Like it was a, it was a horrible experience for me. And so I've always believed that. And so the, the story here is, you know, we, we put out these two big products at scale and actually Amex responded. So last year they put out the first credit card that didn't have a personal guarantee attached to it in the United States. And so I thought that was like pretty extraordinary, but there is, um, I know Neo is building some pretty cool financial products in Canada. I think Wealth Simple has continued to be like an incredible leader um, on the Canadian side. Certainly we're active in, you know, the founder space on um, on the Canadian side, but it's, it's just a matter of us reimagining and, and building better products. And there's many people working on this. And so I, it's to, coming, totally, uh, but I think it's, it's gonna take a little bit longer. Totally agree. I, I wanna shift the conversation a little bit to uh, culture, workplace, talent. Uh, we got a really great question here from Colleen Smith, who says, you yeah. know, at one of our networking tables, we talked about how culture creates value. Would you agree with this statement? And how do you, and, and do you have any advice on how to attract the best talent and, and in particular women? Um, culture eats strategy for breakfast. That would kind of be my, my line. Culture is incredibly important. It is so hard to define. And I believe the best definition of culture are the unwritten rules. Culture is not the values that you write on the wall. It's the way things happen without anyone saying anything. Yeah. <laughs> it's the expectation around turnaround time. It is how you get back to your colleagues. It is how much of a jerk or not a jerk you are. It is whether, you know, low performance is tolerated at your organization and whether you get second chances after you haven't delivered on time, you know, once or twice. That is actually what makes organizations run. So my best advice on, on this is like you set the tone as leaders and you need to think about your own actions all the time and when you do this and it's i think it's generally it's it's easier when things are going well right it's easier to give people autonomy and it's easier to give people control and that's a great leadership environment i think those are things when people are not performing that need to be pulled away and people need to see that there's other ways of doing something and that we're not in this organization going to take losses because something got hard or something got difficult to do um i think you know, as I've scaled this organization, I've, you know, when you're small and you're a family, you can almost unlimitedly trust everyone because there's only 20 or 50 of you. And, you know, now I've had to move to a model that we're still very transparent, but there's a little bit more of like trust and just like verify a little bit, because if people start selling you, they're selling the wrong person. Hmm. Everyone in an organization needs to be completely transparent about like, we're doing a great job. We're doing a terrible job. We're going to be, we're going to lose because if you have people internally that are selling you and I've had moments where this has happened, 
it, it never works out because it feels like you're playing on the different team. It's never your job to sell your boss. It's your job to collaborate and to figure out how to solve one of these core issues. Um, on the recruiting side, I think this has all changed. I think recruiting got a whole lot easier because everyone's at home. I mean, remember when someone used to wear like a dress shirt to the office and you'd be like, oh, are they going to an interview? <laughs> and you'd even kind of weirdly know because no one like leaves their desk at noon to, to do something funny. Um, so in many ways you can find, you know, more interesting forms of talent. We have completely broadened our net on the talent we're looking for. I mean, since COVID we've hired more than a hundred people. We have data scientists in Richmond, Virginia and in New York and in San Francisco, we have German engineers. We've actually like just been able to take talent from around the world and get them to build with us. Um, but I, and so, so I think, you know what, I, a lot of opportunities there. I just want to challenge you for a second because I think, um, isn't it incredibly hard to build culture when, you know, right now we listen, we're working from home. I don't know when your world collapsed. March 12th, 2020 was when it collapsed. We're a year into this. This is like the okay. anniversary. I, I just think that it's incredibly hard to build culture when people are working from home. And because so much of culture is that energy, it's the vibe, it's when people are together, it's when you're looking at somebody face to face in their eyes. And, you know, I know lots of people are deploying a work from home strategy, not only now, but, you know, beyond the pandemic. And you, you've seen people getting hired and, you know, even go to different organizations without ever, ever seeing anybody. I, like, I think this is hurting Crazy. culture at the end of the day. I, I, oh, maybe not, but, but I'd love to get your point on this. I know you're hiring um, people across the world, but I, I, is it hurting the culture at the end of the day because they can't see people in real life, Michelle? You know, I'm still adapting and growing my views on this. I, before COVID, I was 100%. We had no work from home policy. There was no like, you can just like work from home if you want. It's like everyone had to be in the office. I believed in all of the like run-ins and the way we communicated and the way you could tell if people were okay or not okay. Like you can go months without even seeing all the people in your organization. Like it's terrible. Um, so look, I was a huge advocate of working from a single office. We made everyone move to Toronto. And like anything else, my views have been completely challenged on this. I mean, we've had an incredible year of growth that I thought was impossible. We have figured out better ways to communicate. We still think that having a portion of in-person, I think now because we've just hired and because we're, we're growing internationally and because we'll truly never have everyone under one roof anymore, we're thinking about, well, how do we get together in person six times a year for a week at a time and you know reset what we're building and get to work together in that period of time. But can we go back and, and work in our other places after that? I mean, I think that 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 is core to you know maybe one of our solutions, but I don't I don't know if I can predict the future on this. I think that one of the things is that we always struggled with this belief. We just thought work from home, and and I I, I held this bias right. I thought work from home meant you were like kind of two percent working and like eighty percent doing your laundry. <laughs> yeah. I just didn't believe that there was working happening at home, and there was this energy, and the whole world proved us wrong. I mean, you know, we made a vaccine in the fastest time period in history that we've ever done so like the markets are roaring tons of deals are getting done it's totally possible to continue building um online is that the best thing for culture i'm not sure but does that actually mean we need to go 100 percent back to the way we were before i'm not so certain either but do you do you think at, at some point that it actually kills innovation because you know so much of innovation is having those collisions is having people and ideas come together um and i'm sure uh, many of your groundbreaking ideas have come from you know, just jamming, right? Uh, yeah. Coming up with crazy ideas after a couple drinks. Uh, don't you lose a, a little bit of that innovation? I mean, I held that belief forever, for <laughs> sure. I, I held that belief that, you know, it was, it was these off brainstorming sessions where, you know, you had to figure this out, but we've been able to do it. I mean, we've hopped on the phone, we've hopped on Clubhouse, we've hopped on like, you know, or Discord or whatever, all the, all the platforms that we're using are just Zooms and, and, been able to recreate that and it's not perfect uh but we've managed to make it work yeah. how much of that we did just out of sheer necessity versus how much easier it is i'm not sure of that we'll see when the world returns if we can still if we can still get that or not but i think it's a it's a great question and i have i have well, no idea how this is all going to play out we, we have somebody in the comment that fundamentally disagrees with me he says i disagree that you cannot build culture remotely it takes a lot more work 
but it can happen. Alvin continues to say a virtual walk of the four corners, for example, even a five minute virtual connection helps. So Alvin is uh, angry at me. Um, no, so, so oh, good, no, good. I don't think anyone has the right answer on this, Sean yeah. or Alvin or, or me. I, I think that I have been, here's what I know. I've been completely shocked. I, I did not think that this was possible. And I think that humans can do absolutely anything out of necessity. And so now it is without the necessity to do this, will we still do it as well? And have we learn new habits? And a year is actually a long time to build new habits. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you a question about Dragon's Den. I know everybody wants to talk. Everybody likes to talk, talk to you about Dragon's Den. It's a reality show. It's crazy. It's wild. Um, and I know you get a ton of questions about that. It's probably a lot of people in Canada, they, 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 uh, they bump into you and they ask you the craziest questions about it. Um, I want to know from you, it, how real is this thing, right? Like how real are, are, are the pitches? Uh, are, you, are you vetting them beforehand? Like, you know, because I see some people coming to the Dragon's Den and they look crazy. Like, I'm like, how did these guys get through? So can you just unveil the hood a little bit of what's happening on Dragon's Den? Yeah, of course. Um, so we know nothing about the pitchers before they come on. We literally get their name. So it's like, it, they'll say, Sean is coming in next. They don't give us the name of your company or the website. And they're actually extremely good at hiding companies that are coming on the show. And that's how you get raw reactions. Like when we're really like, what the heck is this? Like we actually don't know. And that, that makes for good television is we're all learning in real time together. Um, probably the next secret of the show is we spend about an hour with each pitch and then that gets edited into seven minutes. And so you can imagine if you took the top seven minutes of your day every day, it would be the most, it would be the best seven minutes. And so you can create a lot of drama that way. Probably the third secret is that all the fights are real. We are, we didn't know each other before the show. We film it all in basically two or three weeks back to back. And so when people get frustrated, those frustrations are very real. It's not like we are literally in that studio hungry or before lunch and snapping at each other. Uh, so that is very real and that is totally unscripted. Um, and then, and then. Um, so, so I want the I, last, yeah. Yeah, so I wanted to ask you, how do you, you know, you, you've now, you, you've seen thousands of pitches in the den. You see thousands of founders uh, through ClearBank. Um, and there's, there, there's so many people in this audience, they're looking to deploy capital as well. What are you looking for when it comes to finding that unicorn, finding that rocket ship? Uh, right. What are some of those key attributes? Because I think uh, a lot of people in the audience, would they, they, they're looking for the same thing. Yeah, there's there's probably three things that I care about the most. The first, and this is this is equity. This is not ClearBank is is very different. First thing is um, just the founder, someone who is completely resilient, someone who is going to get up time and time and time again. And resilience can come from everyone and in a lot of different places. But I'm trying to test for that. And on the show, they do a great disservice to this because we often talk about size of market and. TAM and their individual margins. But I, I know when I'm looking at those founders that oftentimes it's not this product that's going to make them successful. It's their next iteration. Number two, I really try and look for business models long-term that have win-win characteristics for both sides. Um, I have consistently seen arbitrage opportunities shrink in my career as, as markets get more and more competitive. And so the best example I can give you of this is, you know, there was a couple, a couple years ago on the show, there was two ex-cops that came on Dragon's Den. They said, look, we have this idea that we are going to build the Airbnb for RVs. And, you know, did you know that there's 2 million RVs in Canada that are used on average for two weeks a year? So if we build this marketplace, which Airbnb won't do because it's a, it's a vehicle and there's insurance and it's far more complicated to rent an RV than even to rent someone's home, you know, the renter benefits because there's so much more selection. These are 2 million RVs we've basically freed up in Canada. And then the RV owner benefits because they've gotten to monetize an asset that's basically been sitting in their, in their driveway. And so those are the models that, that have long-term characteristics of, of winning. Probably the third thing that I look for is a really deep TAM and size of market. And this one's tricky because for founders to be successful, they need to be successful in one very specific vertical to start. If you start too broad, you are often not successful at all, right? Even so, like a so great- I, yeah. I just want to stop you for a second because uh, in the last session that we had, they said, throw away TAM. TAM is fundamentally useless. So uh, perhaps tell us why maybe TAM is important. Um, 
Well, because like software has zero marginal costs. It is one of these few unique items that it costs you the same amount to make five units as to make like 5 million units. Like there's so few things in business that ever look like that. And so being able to continue to expand your TAM completely change your output. And, and I think TAM, maybe even at the series A is like a little bit premature, but it, it does look, we got a ton of questions on TAM in the early days. We were like, e-commerce is so small and no one believed in it. And like, they just, like, I remember getting pummeled on this question being like, I'm pretty certain there's enough entrepreneurs to build us a pretty big business here. But I have found when you have an unlimited TAM and, and that's where people get confused because they don't understand their expansion verticals. So like, ClearBank started and we just served American e-commerce companies. And then we just served Canadian e-commerce companies. Like we added Canada to that. And then we added the UK and then we added SaaS companies. And so now the, the group of companies that could use capital for repeatable expenses is actually quite large. Um, but we, so it's, it's really defining is your first vertical, your whole TAM, I think, but whatever, I'm a huge believer in TAM. I think it, I think it really matters. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I understand that other people, you know, could be incorrect. I also don't, I'm not looking for a McKinsey number on TAM. Like by the time McKinsey has written their report on an industry, all the early players are there. You know what I mean? Like Coinbase was almost a billion dollar company by the time McKinsey's kind of picking that up. Um, and so you're not looking for like a piece of research report. You're looking at, at, at far more earlier leading indicators. Don't throw McKinsey under the bus. Oh my goodness. Um, I'm not throwing them under the bus. I'm just saying <laughs> that's, that's when conventional research is. Yeah, totally. I, I totally get it. Listen, we're, we're almost at time here. And, uh, yeah. If you have some personal questions for Michelle, uh, you know, please put them in the chat. We can, we can get a little bit more personal. I, I, I want to ask you really quickly. I just feel like the world is uh, changing here in 2021. Um, over the last number of months, we've seen things like GameStop, AMC, just go bananas, meme stocks. Like what is happening? Like it feels like the, there are internet communities that are now running uh, the world. Can you comment a little bit of what you're seeing and, and maybe even how it's impacting the things that you're investing in? Yeah, um, I think this is one of the most fascinating phenomenons that we've ever seen. And I believe it is rooted in one thing. People are incredibly bored. Like we have never ever had the amount of time to spend on the internet that we would. Remember, we used to go for drinks with friends and like stay out all night or like spend weekends with our family and like watch movies together and like go on trips and airplanes. Like, I think that people underestimated how much time we had. And you, and you can see it in social media usage, but you couple an enormous amount of time on the internet coupled with, you know, right now, when you look at the amount of money we have printed, we did way more than just replace lost wages. I think it's like, a, it's another 13% bump on top of that. And so that means that that money didn't just go to replacing wages, it went to other things. And so people put that money into investments and into savings because there was really very few places to, to spend your discretionary income in the last year. I mean, you could buy Uber Eats and you couldn't really buy much else, right? You could furnish your own home or you could make a renovation, which we saw a ton of, but generally, I mean, there was, there was no trips, there was no concerts, there was, there was none of these discretionary items. So what we are seeing is the compounding effect of people with a lot of time and with more discretionary capital and that is exactly why we've seen all these phenomena. That's exactly why we saw Robin Hood explode and people starting to say, well, I can't do sports betting, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to basically do betting in the stock market. That's why we've seen you know, NFTs and this GameStop movement and internet communities around all of this. I think you know, there will be more of these you know, as we are in lockdown. And I think as lockdown you know, stops occurring, I just think we'll see less and less of this kind of, yeah, so frankly, pretty silly behavior. <laughs> <laughs> so the fact that we're bored and uh, we're, we're, we're spending our excess capital and time on the weirdest and wackiest things, uh, I totally agree. Last question, just to end it off. This is a yeah. super difficult question. Um, everyone wants to know in the chat, Michelle, what is your favorite movie? This is from what? Kimberly. What is oh, your favorite, favorite movie? movie? Um, oh my goodness. Uh, I always, I always think Shawshank Redemption is my favorite movie just because it's like such classic. Um, I think uh, I love the stories of other entrepreneurs. I think I probably like I don't really watch a lot of movies once or twice, but like I watch The Social Network a ton. I mean, I just 
I think that any story that shares, I watched that incredible story about, um, it was like the Netflix series about, uh, what was it called? The black female founder that made the hair products in the early days. Like any yeah. story of founders. Who? Okay, I okay, love. okay. So it who is going to play me. you? I'm going to ask you, this is my last question. <laughs> who is going to play you? In the in your story, oh, like who who is the actress that, that that's gonna John, play you? John, you're, you're, you're too kind. Um, because I want to, I want Will Smith to be in this movie playing me right now, interviewing you that's in this amazing. theater. Amazing. Okay. Okay. Uh, Charlize Theron or Margot Robbie? I think those would be uh, those would be my favorite. I think they would do a great <laughs> job. Well, Michelle, uh, you were amazing. You you provided so many uh, knowledge bombs for the audience, and I think what you are doing is super disruptive. Um, and I, I can't wait to see um, how you take Clear Bank, Clear Angel uh, to the next level. Um, I really appreciate your time today. And uh, yeah, th this, was, uh, this was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. It was wonderful to be here with you all. All right, Mike, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back to you.